uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, moving uh, fast enough on the course uh, to uh, today address the issue of nuclear applications in space. I'll try to make the point that uh, travel to other parts of the solar system, uh, including the exploration of Mars, uh, would need uh, the use of nuclear energy uh, on a very substantial uh, scale, both for the propulsion systems, uh, uh, reducing the mission time to Mars to weeks rather than a full year, and uh, uh, providing a very high specific impulse in rockets. Uh, in that case, uh, 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 the propulsion would need, in that case, nuclear energy. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that uh, the last semester, uh, one of the students that uh, participated in our class uh, had acted as an internet with the SpaceX organization. And yesterday, in fact, the United States Air Force has been trying to launch from a B-52 a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a scram jet. So uh, it's really still uh, in space, but uh, the nuclear scram jet would be a very efficient way of providing propulsion uh, in space. So let's learn as much as we can about uh, nuclear propulsion and uh, uh, the aspects of why is it that we need to uh, extend uh, our technological civilization according to the Kardashian scale, remember the first lecture, uh, into uh, space. Uh, it's a very fascinating topic and I invite you all to maybe participate in the, uh, in the effort. So, uh, uh, we already covered one part of the notes on space nuclear power, the part on the nuclear power, but I'll try to cover as many of the other chapters uh, on propulsion on uh, power reactors uh, and uh, particularly uh, cosmic and space radiation. Uh, let's uh, start with the chapter on nuclear and plasma space propulsion. Why is it that we need to develop uh, the possibility of uh, using nuclear energy in space and what has been done uh, and what can be uh, done. Uh, a famous uh, author, uh, uh, Arthur Clarke, uh, the person uh, who wrote the book on Space Odyssey 2001 and so on, uh, is, can be quoted here. Two possibilities exist, uh, either that we are alone in the universe or we are not. Uh, Either way, it's fine. Uh, uh, if you are not alone, then we can survive with other uh, advanced uh, or uh, civilizations, technological civilizations. And if we are alone, then it is our destiny to spread uh, life and be stewards of life to the rest of the uh, universe. Uh, uh, again, we come back to what we mentioned early in the first uh, uh, lecture about uh, Enrico Fermi, uh, the Far Fermi paradox, and uh, the topic of aliens that keeps coming up, whether they exist or not. Uh, and uh, basically, he's, <coughs> he's quoted to having said at a lunch uh, with some of his colleagues in 1950, don't you ever wonder where everybody is? And uh, this is a Fermi uh, paradox. Notice that the Earth, uh, uh, the universe is uh, as, uh, 12, uh, 13 point seven billion years old, but the Earth itself uh, is four point six or yeah billion years old, and uh, it resulted from what we called earlier maybe a supernova or the collision of two neutron uh, stars. So if our universe thirteen point seven billion years old and the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, there have been billions of years, more than millions for other maybe technological civilizations to evolve in general. Uh, some people suggest that we may be the only uh, one present, uh, having been lucky enough to overcome uh, really uh, great uh, filters. And uh, one filter could be just a pandemic that would wipe up the human race or uh, an asteroid or a comet that could hit the Earth. And like what happened at the age 
of the dinosaurs, dinosaurs 65 million years ago, uh, caused uh, massive extinctions. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we have survived quite a few of these uh, great uh, filters. And uh, an answer to the Fermi paradox, we come back to it, is, oh, we are right here. Uh, nobody else survived to our state. Uh, the filter is behind us. Nobody is there to show us a path. We have to blaze the trail ourselves. Uh, as we are too early, it is our destiny as a human race to lend a helping hand to those who will follow us. Further, there could be life out there, but not as we know it uh, in general. Uh, humans, of course, uh, feel an innate mission to preserve and spread life to the rest of the universe. Uh, with their acquired intelligence, science, and technology, they feel that it is it's their sacred destiny to preserve life, starting with the equivalent of a Noah's Ark. So that should be the emphasis of the space program, because extinctions can happen on, on Earth uh, uh, by extra uh, kind of uh, uh, sources of uh, extinction, like uh, an asteroid, uh, uh, but uh, uh, on Earth, as humans, we have control on several of those uh, possible extinction uh, starters, and that would be, for instance, uh, an epidemic like what we are going through right now. Uh, some people suggest that it was started by stupid, uh, uh, I don't know what happened here uh, to me. Uh, there is an internet uh, instability. Uh, it just switched somewhere else, but let's keep going. Uh, uh, we have control on global warming, for instance. We have control on the spread of pandemics, which is, uh, suspected to have uh, started by what's called uh, <clears throat> gain of function research, which is a disguise of uh, designing and generating biological uh, weapons. Uh, we might uh, find ourselves uh, first uh, creating a Noah's Ark on the moon. Uh, so if extinction happens on the Earth, uh, a base on the moon would uh, provide Earth with a way of reseeding uh, 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 the Earth back with intelligence and uh, uh, life in general, if some event uh, as a hurdle uh, is uh, affecting us. And uh, we have to cherish the Earth. This is a beautiful picture taken by the astronauts that went to the moon on the Apollo uh, mission, uh, showing the Earth as a very precious blue pearl up there uh, in space from uh, the moon. Uh, following maybe a base on the moon, we may find our way uh, to other planets. Uh, some people suggest Mars, and some people suggest maybe uh, Venus in general. Uh, the Apollo missions were uh, the first uh, uh, steps that humans tried to escape uh, the gravity of Earth. And uh, there have been six moon landings, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo 14, uh, Apollo 15, and Apollo 16, Apollo 17. Uh, so six uh, moon landings. Some people think, oh, it was only one Apollo mission. No, there were six moon landings on the moon and humans have left their trace of their feet uh, uh, on the moon. That was from the Apollo 11 uh, picture. Uh, it happened on July 20th, 1969. So definitely we are going back to, uh, to the moon. And uh, in that case, as engineers, uh, and uh, we are going to be contributing to the effort, some of us more than others. And uh, you could see here that uh, 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 getting a, a base on the moon or uh, traveling in space uh, requires some power requirements. So this shows us here the uh, a graph. Uh, let me magnify it here. Uh, it uh, shows us the, uh, 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 this is, uh, uh, I think the y axis is, I have to magnify it here. Uh, uh, it, it shows here uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dependence on the days over which the missions in space would uh, last. So if they are uh, in uh, days, uh, fuel cells will do the job, but if we go to 
missions that are requiring years, well, there is no other choice we have other than uh, nuclear uh, energy. And uh, uh, so this is, shows it also in hours. And this is basically the uh, requirements uh, of, uh, in, uh, of, uh, uh, of fuel uh, in uh, kilograms and the energy that is required for those different missions. So for uh, large uh, missions, uh, uh, we can use still combustion engines, which would be chemical rockets. Uh, in space, you use, say, uh, a mixture of uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, for very short missions, our battery has been doing the job real nicely. Uh, fuel cells, where you use hydrogen and uh, combine it uh, with oxygen in space, uh, solar cells and isotopic generators, we covered that in a previous chapter, can also uh, provide us with uh, mission times in the range of maybe a few uh, uh, years, but nuclear reactor generators are needed for long-term missions, whether it's propulsion uh, or uh, providing power on a base on the moon, on, say, on Mars as a starting point. Uh, uh, human destiny uh, is... Uh, uh, coupled uh, with space travel, and uh, uh, other than Kardashev, the cosmologist uh, that uh, mentioned to us that we have to harness more energy, maybe the whole energy of our solar system uh, to qualify as a, a, a category one civilization. Um, another the, uh, famous uh, astronomer, uh, Frank Drake, and uh, he's a person who originated the effort of what's called the SETI project or the search for extraterrestrial uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, in 1960, he came out uh, with a suggestion uh, considering the probabilities, here we're talking probabilities of the existence of intelligent life in the universe. And he tried to estimate the probable, so probable because it's probabilities, based on probabilities, how many number capital N of planets with Earth-like life uh, with a technological civilization in the known universe. And he came up with what became known as the Drake's equation, a very different, a uh, very famous equation here. So the number of intelligent civilizations in the universe would be equal uh, to R star, the number of star systems. And guess what? We have billions of them. We know we have galaxies and uh, uh, so far from us, uh, and uh, uh, there are billions of them, but it doesn't mean that life exists there. You have to multiply that by the probability of the occurrence of stars with planets. And that has been established. Uh, we have been lately discovering planet upon planet upon planets surrounding different stars. However, there is only a fraction of those planets that have uh, habitable environments that could be basically a habitable environment means that uh, uh, you have water or other forms of energy uh, that can supply energy to some form of life. Uh, basically, then that's multiplied by the piece of L, the probability that life has originated on a given planet, then multiplied by the probability that the evolved creatures have the technology to send signals to us or to uh, send radio waves like what we are doing right now, uh, sending radio waves from our TVs and uh, our uh, uh, radio communications and even microwaves uh, to the rest of the universe. An important factor in the Drake's equation is capital L, which is the longevity factor. So the suggestion here is that uh, the, there exist those hurdles uh, that the civilization has to overcome, <coughs> either caused by natural phenomena or uh, the civilization basically simply destroys itself. And uh, for us on Earth, global warming can destroy us, can uh, shorten our longevity factor. Uh, uh, nuclear war can shorten our longevity factor and gain a function research, uh, which uh, is suspected to have led to the existing uh, virus pandemic. Uh, as I suggested, you can go and uh, Google gain of function GOF and learn more about it, uh, we would be destroying ourselves by trying to uh, destroy each other. Uh, here is a, a, a description of the known uh, uh, galaxy that we live in, which is called the Milky 
Way Galaxy. Why is this uh, called the Milky Way Galaxy? Some of you definitely have gone out at night uh, away from the light pollution from cities and looked at the sky and found that wonderful sight of the uh, a cut through the Milky Way uh, Galaxy. And uh, uh, the Milky Way Galaxy contains, it's a rotating galaxy, as you could see here. It has arms that uh, look like spirals and uh, some of them is a Sagittarius arm. Uh, you have nebulae, uh, and uh, here is our sun position in the Milky Way galaxy, and around our sun, of course, we have uh, our Earth and the uh, uh, other planets, whether they are the gaseous planets like Jupiter or the solid planets like Venus and uh, Mars and uh, the Earth. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, periodic mass extinctions, as we have learned uh, from the fossil record on Earth, say the extinction of the dinosaurs, uh, suggests that some uh, of the uh, uh, events uh, can uh, that led us to uh, overcome many of the hurdles uh, uh, have been overcome uh, uh, because of the uh, simply pure luck. So here uh, we can suggest a a modified form of the uh, previous equation by Drake by adding a factor uh, n sub e, for instance, and uh, uh, let's take uh, some of the probabilities. One of the probabilities that you could add p sub y here uh, would account for the fact that our sun is a yellow dwarf of just the right size uh, so as not to destroy Earth within its uh, 11 or 22 year solar cycle flares. Uh, we are coming out from the bottom of uh, a minimum of the solar cycle, and it takes 11 years. Uh, another interesting uh, 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 factor would be P sub gamma, shown in the equation here. Uh, this is based on new knowledge that we have acquired since Drake in 1960 wrote his equation, uh, the pro provided that we, uh, 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 we survive uh, the gamma rays burst. We covered that in the chapter on gamma rays interaction with matter, which would sterilize the whole galaxy, totally the whole galaxy. And then we have uh, some uh, lucky uh, occurrence is that uh, uh, Jupiter uh, is protecting uh, the Earth. So it provides us with another uh, 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 probability here, P sub J. And uh, we have seen basically Jupiter by its massive large mass, it would become a star if it had a larger mass, and the, but it's a gaseous uh, planet uh, at the center of uh, Jupiter. Uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, behaves like a metal from its uh, very high gravitational uh, pressure uh, in that case. And it has been protecting the Earth by attracting to itself uh, comets and asteroids, which would have caused extinctions on our Earth. Uh, so this is uh, a modified form of the uh, 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 Drake's equation. Uh, however, uh, 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 an optimistic view uh, would uh, not consider just probabilities, but consider possibilities. And uh, possibility theory is a different theory mathematically than probability theory. Uh, and on it, uh, we base uh, the uh, field of logic that we call fuzzy uh, logic uh, or the theory of plausibility. We talk about possibilities or possibilities. And uh, when you multiply probabilities in probability theory and you switch to possibility theory, you replace all those probabilities by possibilities. Uh, the product of all of them, which is an end gate in the field of logic, uh, turns into the minimum of all those possibilities. And those possibilities definitely are uh, uh, definitely less than one, but uh, nevertheless, there can be very close uh, to one. The only factor that we really understand in that uh, either the modified Drake equation here that introduces uh, uh, effects not considered by uh, 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 Mr. Drake is that uh, uh, is the R star factor. We know uh, uh, that uh, our uh, uh, galaxy contains from 100 to 400 billion star system alone in our galaxy. And we have hundreds of galaxies, uh, maybe billions or millions of galaxies in the universe. So some people suggest that life should exist in some way or the other elsewhere in the universe. 
uh, to survive, uh, uh, survive human civilization needs to expand itself uh, into uh, space. And uh, I'll quote here uh, 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 some, uh, let me see the, the, who uh, gave us that quote, uh, that uh, Professor Stevens Hawking, uh, a great uh, scientist, uh, he passed away, but he suggested, although the chance of a disaster to planet Earth in a given year may be quite low, it adds up over time and becomes a near certainty in the next thousand of 10,000 years. By that time, we should have, have spread out into space and to other stars. So a disaster on Earth would not mean the end of the human race. However, we will not establish self-sustaining colonies in space for at least the next hundred years. So we have to be very careful in that period. And this is very, very smart smart quote that we have to all heed together. Concerning the Fermi paradox, uh, its main points are formalized by Michael Hart. First, there are billions of stars in the Milky Way similar to the sun. And in fact, yes, now, uh, almost daily now, uh, new planets are being discovered. And uh, 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 some uh, scientists suggest that some of them would have a livable zone like the Earth. Uh, it doesn't preclude that there are other forms of life other than the one that we have on Earth, which depends on water and oxygen in the air. Two, with uh, high probability, some of these stars are Earth-like planets. And if the Earth is typical, some may have already developed intelligent life. Some of the civilization may have developed interstellar travel. Even at the slow pace of currently envisioned interstellar travel, the Milky Way galaxy could be completely traversed in a few million years. And since many of the stars similar to the sun are billions of years older, this would even uh, would seem to provide plenty of time. Another gentleman, Jonathan Carroll Nellenbeck, suggests if you do not account for the motion of stars uh, when you try to solve this problem, he means by that the Fermi paradox, you are basically left with one of two solutions. Either nobody leaves their planet, or we are in fact the only technological civilization in the galaxy. Stars orbit the center of the galaxy on different paths at different speeds. They occasionally pass each other. So aliens could be waiting for their next destination to come closer. <laughs> it's sobering here to think about that. But uh, uh, the most important uh, aspect of it uh, is that if we are the only civilization in the galaxy, uh, it's our destiny to spread life in the rest of the uh, universe. Uh, so this is uh, the point of the Drake equation in its uh, uh, modification. Uh, something that uh, is uh, associated with the existence of life similar to what we have on Earth is the existence of phosphorus. Uh, it seems that phosphorus uh, is uh, a, a preclude to some form of life that uh, looks like the one on Earth, because if you look at the uh, chromosome, this looks, shows, shows us here uh, <clears throat> uh, the spiral uh, form in, in a chromosome and we have the genes uh, on it, you'll find that some parts of the uh, chromosome definitely contain phosphorus. Look at all those little stars here. So a form of life that would have the DNA like ours uh, would contain phosphorus. So we have to look for phosphorus uh, and uh, phosphorus basically is the basis of the DNA, uh, the RNA, and uh, the ATP, uh, which cells use to produce energy. And uh, that has to do with the adenosine triphosphate ATP. Uh, its composition in cells definitely contains P here for phosphorus. Uh, the ATP contains phosphorus, the ADP diphosphate contains phosphorus, and the monophosphate contains uh, phosphorus uh, in general. So. Uh, uh, this is some kind of uh, uh, an indication of the presence of life similar to ours here uh, on Earth. Uh, different processes uh, have uh, taken part in the formation of the elements. Uh, some of them were the Big Bang fusion uh, at the very beginning of the universe, uh, uh, dying low mass stars, exploding massive stars, human sensories uh, with no stable isotopes, uh, cosmic ray fission, merging neutron stars, exploding white dwarfs. So it is not just a supernova that is under consideration. This is a modified form of the 
uh, periodic table of the elements. And uh, it shows us basically that phosphorus 31 uh, is a very, very low process. So the formation of life that would look like ours would be very low. Uh, these uh, two parts of the periodic table here contain the lanthanides uh, series, and this would be containing the actinide series. If you add to those two series here, you find yourself expanding uh, the periodic table of the elements, but some of those uh, <coughs> elements formation is favored by a different star uh, 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 processes. For instance, if you think about dying low mass stars, you can identify the elements that were formed uh, this way. Uh, however, the very heavy elements, the americium, the curium, and so on, uh, would have been formed uh, from human synthesis, and there are no stable isotopes for those elements. However, the actinides, uh, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, basically <coughs> are suggested to have formed during the merging of neutron stars uh, in general. Uh, the uh, formation of the stable phosphorus isotope, phosphorus 31, uh, comes in from the formation of silicon 31 that emits negative electrons, uh, emits a gamma photon of 1.266 million electron volt and becomes phosphorus 31. So this is uh, phosphorus 31 seems to be a condition for the existence of a life form that uh, uh, looks like our uh, DNA. It doesn't mean that uh, other forms of life that depend on other uh, physics and chemistry exist. For instance, even on Earth here, you'll find that we can find biochemical life forms uh, that depend on arsenic asphalt bacteria. And that happens in Mono Lake in California. It contains arsenic eating bacteria. So bacteria there are living on arsenic, which is toxic to human life. So uh, there may be other forms of life that depends on different chemistries and physics in the rest of the universe. Uh, these are the cyanobacteria uh, that uh, on Earth uh, 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 generated the oxygen that uh, we uh, today uh, depend on both as plants and as uh, mammals and other animals uh, in general. Uh, deep ocean, the deep ocean also have different forms of life. We know that in the fumaroles or uh, volcanic uh, 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 emissions that contain primarily H2S or hydrogen sulfide uh, in general. All right, so uh, life uh, uh, in the universe could be in different forms and uh, uh, life on Earth is uh, threatened by uh, the hurdles that uh, we mentioned uh, earlier of the filters, if you uh, if you want to use the word filters, uh, and uh, to expand our reach beyond the Earth, uh, well, we have reached the Moon, but uh, we want we have also reached Mars with probes, Venus with probes, uh, but not uh, humans yet. Uh, nuclear thermal propulsion comes uh, to our help and uh, into uh, considerations. Uh, there are uh, different forms of nuclear propulsion. Uh, one of them that is suggested is solid reactor core. Uh, that's called, uh, so in that case, you get a nuclear reactor. You have a, a reactor core. You bring in a, a, a propellant, in that case, hydrogen from a tank. Uh, so hydrogen becomes a fuel, in that case, for the chemical rocket. You pump it uh, into the reactor, you heat it, and then you exhaust it through a nozzle. And you use that uh, liquid hydrogen, which is, would be cryogenic and very cold, to cool. You could see here the pipe coming in here uh, as a feed line and surround the nozzle to cool it. Otherwise, the heat generated by the uh, hot uh, uh, hydrogen ex exiting the nuclear reactor would melt the metal. So you notice that you have those uh, coils or wiring around the rockets uh, uh, nozzles, in that case, uh, that's a cooling uh, process. Without the cooling, we do not have uh, those rockets. And in fact, the design has been suggested. It's uh, the Nerva design here, uh, where you have a big nozzle uh, and uh, uh, you'll have a nuclear reactor with control rods uh, and the tank that contains the hydrogen. Notice that you are not burning hydrogen and oxygen. If you burn hydrogen uh, and oxygen, you need two tanks uh, one for the fuel, in that case, the hydrogen, and one for the uh, one for the propellant, the 
hydrogen and the other one would be the oxygen uh, in a chemical rocket to combine with the hydrogen produce steam or water. In a nuclear reactor, all you need is hydrogen, hence, hence the weight of the system would be much less. And also the reactor uh, would contain much more energy than the chemical energy uh, in any form uh, that uh, you could think of. So nuclear reactors in that case would have a very low mass, but a very large amount of energy uh, for the propulsion process. And that's why uh, nuclear reactors would be ideal for uh, propulsion. Uh, a design of a nuclear reactor would have the core, you would have the nozzle, uh, you'd have a reflector around the core to reflect neutrons and make them small uh, in size. Uh, you bring in the, uh, uh, the hydrogen in that case, you heat it up and you exhaust it from the uh, nozzle. And of course you bring in a flow to cool the surface of the nozzle. And that was a part of uh, 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 the design of a nuclear reactor. Another uh, type of a reactor would not be a solid core like shown in the previous diagrams, but a gaseous solid core. So you would use in that case, fission and uranium hexafluoride in the core of a reactor and uh, you inject uh, the hydrogen into it, it will heat up and exhaust in a nozzle. So all uh, these ideas are uh, for uh, nuclear fission reactors. Uh, you can also use what's called electrical uh, propulsion. So supposedly on a spacecraft, uh, you would have uh, uh, a crew uh, and uh, that would be the crew uh, uh, enclosure right here. And uh, then uh, you uh, uh, use the energy that the uh, source that you have uh, to produce electricity and the electricity at the end of the spacecraft here uh, would uh, use uh, what's called the thrusters. And, uh, the thrusters would eject uh, the accelerated ions, heavy ions of maybe uh, uh, heavy elements like xenon, for instance. And uh, this is a, a, a a, a, an artist depiction of such a craft that will uh, take us to Jupiter. This is a very large uh, <clears throat> uh, storm on Jupiter that has been lasting for uh, years and years now. So that would be uh, uh, the name of that uh, particular kind of a ship is called the Prometheus Ion Thruster. So we can have fission reactors. Uh, we can have uh, also ion uh, pr uh, propulsion and uh, a depiction of it uh, shown in the uh, book and the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, the author was Arthur Clarke. Uh, he wrote the book, turned it into a movie. Uh, notice that here, this would be the crew compartment, but on a long, long, long beam here, you would have your nuclear reactor provided the power. And uh, you need uh, what's called shadow shielding uh, the radiation from the nuclear reactor should not uh, affect the crew in the crew uh, component here or compartment. Uh, so you provide what's called shadow shielding. You shield the nuclear reactor uh, where it is along that beam and the radiation would never reach the uh, people uh, in the uh, crew compartment. So the crew quarters are positioned on a beam with shadow shielding away from the nuclear rocket engine. So we ha can have nuclear rocket engine. Some people also talked about uh, a, a fusion rather than just a fission reactor. In that case, you uh, create a system that has magnets. This is a cross section of a coil here uh, where you create a thermonuclear plasma. And uh, for instance, you burn uh, deuterium and helium-3. Remember we mentioned that those two deuterium on deuterium fuses with helium-3 you get an alpha particle and you get a proton or hydrogen uh, ion. Uh, both of them are charged particles. So the magnetic field will direct them around, along the nozzle and you can get thrust from the rocket. So there are many, many concepts of rockets for space propulsion. And uh, this is not pie on the sky. Scientists are working on developing these ideas. This is an experiment on a fusion rocket experiment at the University of Washington. Uh, here in the United States. And uh, basically this is a depiction of maybe a futuristic uh, fusion rocket for a Mars mission. We'll describe to you in the next chapters, why is it that we need to think about uh, either a fission rocket or a fusion rocket rather than a chemical uh, rocket.
Uh, one idea that uh, was explored is what uh, was called the uh, uh, Orion uh, concept. In fact, uh, the next spaceship that is being designed for uh, a trip to the moon uh, is named Orion also. But uh, Orion uh, has been suggested initially as a Mars exploration uh, 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 type of a ship. The ship is shown here. It would be manned by four people. <laughs> they call it a taxi. And uh, it would use what's called external pulsed plasma propulsion. How does it work? It works with having a very large number of small nuclear devices, uh, fission devices that you throw out or uh, outside of the uh, enclosure of the ship, explode them here, and then you have here a big, big table uh, or uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, a plate actually that gets the impulse. That's why it's called a pulsed plasma propulsion and gives an impulse to the ship uh, on the top. Uh, obviously, you would uh, uh, assemble that whole kind of a ship uh, in space rather than assemble it on Earth and before you can uh, use it. So for nuclear fusion propulsion will depend maybe or our uh, descendants will depend on the D-helium-3 reaction producing uh, two charged particles. Why charged particles? Because then a charged particle, according to the Lorentz equation or the Joule equation, will rotate around the magnetic field lines. And uh, uh, in contrast to the DT reaction and fusion, deuterium plus tritium, 80% of the energy in that reaction is carried by the neutrons. But here in that reaction, uh, the kinetic energy is carried by the charged particles. Helium-3 is apparently uh, abundant on the surface of the moon, in the dust on the surface of the moon. So it can be mined from the surface of the moon, whereas deuterium is, of course, available in our ocean. The deuterium to hydrogen ratio is 160 parts per million on Earth in general. So in that case, uh, we have uh, many uh, concepts uh, in general. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to think about what are the propellants uh, that a nuclear rocket could use. Obviously, the DT reaction would be the easier one to achieve, but 80% of the energy is carried by the neutrons. So it is not really a, a good concept because you have to slow down the neutrons, extract their kinetic energy, and then uh, turn it into electrical energy, uh, for instance. Uh, this is some possible uh, nuclear propellants. And uh, you'll find that the hydrogen is a, a, a candidate helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And uh, uh, in each one of them, we have uh, a neutron absorption cross-section. Lithium would have the largest one. Boron would have an even larger one if you use the DT reaction and try to extract the energy from uh, the neutrons. And the uh, hydrogen, obviously, is the, uh, the best choice in that case. Now, for a rocket, if we are going to use nuclear propulsion in a rocket, uh, we want to learn uh, very quickly a little bit about uh, 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 rocket physics, and uh, then you become a, a rocket scientist, uh, quote unquote, rocket scientist. Uh, the, uh, the, the description or the figure of merit for comparing different uh, rockets is what we call the specific impulse. Now, what is the impulse in uh, mechanics in general? If you take the force as a function of time, and you integrate it over a certain time, uh, this is what we call the impulse. And uh, basically, it's a time integral of what f of t would be the thrust force of the rocket. Now, what uh, matters uh, uh, primarily in a rocket is not just the total impulse, but the specific impulse. So what is a specific? When you say specific, means it's per unit energy. When you say density, it's a per unit volume. So when you take that impulse here or, uh, and divide it into the weight of uh, the propellant, uh, 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 the integral of f of t dt, or the impulse divided by the weight, uh, that is uh, uh, impulse per unit volume, we call this the specific impulse. And uh, it's a ratio of the total impulse per unit weight of the propellant. It's very simple to remember what is a specific impulse. Obviously, a nuclear rocket, uh, if you have a nuclear energy, uh, you have a, a very, very large amount of energy per unit mass. So that is already uh, an important factor. If you have a chemical rocket, you also need 
both a uh, propellant as well as an oxidizer like hydrogen and oxygen. So half the weight already is gone here. You don't need the, uh, 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 the oxidizer. You don't need uh, to load liquid oxygen on uh, the rocket. Uh, the energy would be contained in the nuclear uh, fuel. Uh, the weight uh, of the fuel uh, basically is an integral of the mass flow rate that you use in your rocket uh, multiplied into the gravity acceleration. And if you integrate the mass flow rate over time, uh, where you are burning the rocket, then that gives you uh, the uh, specific impulse. For a chemical rocket, uh, you need a tremendous amount of uh, uh, that mass flow rate of uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen. Uh, for a nuclear rocket, it's material in the fuel uh, itself. Uh, this is the size of a chemical rocket. This is really the design of the Saturn V rocket that uh, uh, took us basically into the Apollo program. If you visit uh, uh, the Kennedy Space Center or uh, uh, another space center, like in, uh, I think, uh, in Alabama, uh, uh, you can find one of those rockets kept uh, for display on its side, so it's on the ground. Now, notice here the very, very small size of the people there and the drafting. It's a tremendously large uh, rocket, and uh, think about the rocket that would take us to Mars if it's a chemical rocket how bigger it is going uh, to uh, be. Uh, if you simply take an approximation of what we wrote earlier for the specific impulse would be the force multiplied into the time of the burn uh, divided by the mass of the fuel uh, turned into a weight. So that would be the gravity acceleration. If you take the mass of the uh, fuel uh, divided into time, that's a mass flow rate. So in fact, the specific impulse as another formula would be the thrust divided into the mass flow rate or the specific impulse divided into uh, depth. Uh, the interesting thing is what are the units of the specific impulse? Uh, if you take uh, uh, the uh, units of the force uh, in the SI system of units, it's uh, Newtons uh, multiplied into time and then you divide by the gravity acceleration that's meters per second squared and the mass, let's take this equation here and the mass uh, flow rate is kilograms per second, you find that uh, Newton's is kilogram per met meter second square. Uh, force is equal to mass by acceleration. In other words, uh, the units cancel out and guess what? The unit of the specific impulse is something that was not expected. Uh, it's in seconds. So when you take the impulse force uh, integrated over the thrust integrated over time divided by uh, the <coughs> the uh, mass uh, of the fuel, uh, the specific impulse has units of time. And you can compare different modes of propulsion by comparing the specific uh, impulse of different rocket uh, designs. A typical uh, rocket parameters would be that the initial mass could be uh, two, two metric tons or 2,000 kilograms. Uh, the final mass after you burn the fuel, that's a, a mechanical rocket, would be 1,300. So you burn really 700 uh, kilograms uh, would be the fuel. Uh, the duration of operation is very short. The rocket operates only for 30 seconds. And uh, the specific impulse of the propellant could be uh, 2,400 newtons second cube per kilogram meter, uh, which means that if you cancel up the units, it has units of seconds. Uh, so I give you here some of the correct uh, typical characteristics of a rocket for the benefit of our, of our uh, uh, aerospace engineers. Uh, but uh, let us uh, really compare uh, different rocket systems uh, for po a possible trip uh, to Mars. And uh, if you use a chemical, solid or liquid uh, bipropellant, uh, the specific impulse for a trip to Mars uh, chemical rocket like uh, Mr. Elon Musk and SpaceX are thinking about, uh, the specific impulse would be 200 uh, to 400 uh, second. And uh, in that case, uh, you can use hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen as a propellant and oxygen as the oxidizer. Uh, you can use liquid non uh, monopropellants. Uh, the uh, specific impulse would be 180 to 240 seconds again. If you use uh, solar heating, well, you can increase that a little bit from 400 to 700 seconds. But if you use nuclear solid core with a design that was called NERVA, 
uh, you find that uh, immediately you double your chemical or solid uh, specific impulse from say 400, you could see here, uh, it goes to 850 and another design even reaches 1080. If you use a pebble bed design, as it's called, you reach 1000 as, as a specific impulse, 1000 seconds. And uh, uh, again, they uh, you use also different fuels. For instance, you need to reach very high temperatures. So in that case, you use maybe uranium carbide and zirconium uh, carbide. And if you use a nuclear liquid core, uh, you can reach 2000 seconds. And if you use a gaseous core that I mentioned, you can uh, think about, uh, let me see here, the gaseous core, uh, or, uh, liquid analyst, gaseous score, you can reach 5,000 seconds specific impulse. A magnetohydrodynamic plasma can even reach 15,000 seconds. And uh, if you use the, uh, 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 the Orion type of uh, uh, external pulse propulsion, you can reach uh, 5,000 to 10,000 seconds specific impulse. If you have a hybrid of fission and fusion, uh, there is no limit here. You can reach 100,000 seconds. So in that case, you get a fission fusion uh, plasma and uh, uh, the specific impulse uh, 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 of a rocket, of course, uh, determines the acceleration of the rocket. So if you have, uh, if you are using a chemical rocket with a specific impulse here of the 400 maybe uh, seconds, uh, a trip to Mars would take you a whole year. Over a year, uh, solar flares can affect the equipment, it can affect the astronauts, and the body functions, the bone, muscle, and muscle system of the astronauts will deteriorate over that one year just to get there, uh, mission time. If you use a nuclear rocket, even if it's a fission uh, rocket, you are talking about uh, uh, a thousand uh, 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 specific impulse. And if it's a fission, it's 5,000 to 10,000, which means that you can have such high accelerations that your mission time to Mars is not a year to get there and another year to come back. It could be two weeks, three weeks, maybe three weeks in general. Uh, many uh, experiments have been conducted on Earth for uh, typical uh, uh, nuclear uh, space uh, uh, systems. Uh, that's one of them, in fact, shown. That's a, an actual picture. It was the designated as the Kiwi A, and uh, it was a fission reactor core. Uh, where uh, the nozzle would be uh, at the bottom here. And uh, actually, no, the nozzle should be on the top so that they can see what is happening. These are coils that would bring in liquid hydrogen. There were many, many versions of the Kiwi reactor. I'll show you one in operation. You could see here that the top here has been uh, coupled to a nozzle. And you could see there the hydrogen uh, going through the reactor core and then expanding in a nozzle not shown in that uh, design that it would be on top. Uh, if you look at that picture here, uh, this is now the exhausted hydrogen in the desert and that's a Kiwi A. And it was meant for space applications really because uh, NASA knows that to get to the closest uh, uh, a real uh, serious trip to Mars, somebody should uh, get hired as an intern with the SpaceX and make that clear to Mr. Elon Musk. Uh, uh, the core of the reactor would have to be designed using uh, uh, uranium, of course, but uh, uranium carbide uh, can take very high temperatures and uh, you have a coating of niobium uh, carbide and uh, your hydrogen would circulate inside this very high temperature material fission would occur, the fission energy is transmitted uh, to the uh, hydrogen fuel. Uh, and it becomes a fuel in that case because it would uh, be exhausted <coughs> with a high momentum. Uh, not only uh, nuclear reactors were uh, some kind of experimented with for nuclear rockets, but also for a possible uh, plane uh, uh, engine. And uh, this is the a jet airplane engine that was designed for a possible airplane that would uh, circle the earth for basically an unlimited amount of time or years uh, by using nuclear fuel. So that was uh, a test of a nuclear rocket airplane engine, no, not rocket, uh, airplane engine 
uh, in the desert of uh, Idaho at the Idaho National Engineering uh, Laboratories where tests have been uh, conducted uh, in general. Uh, just uh, a comparison here between the different uh, uh, planets in our solar system. Here is Earth. Uh, Earth uh, Mars, uh, interestingly enough, is much smaller than Earth. So some people do not realize that. Uh, and uh, Venus is the same, almost the same size as the Earth. So some people suggest that we should think more about Venus than thinking about uh, colonizing or uh, uh, building a maze base on Mars. Mercury is rather small and close to uh, the sun. And I mentioned Jupiter being a gaseous planet. Now, these planets here, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury are all uh, uh, rocky planets. Uh, there are three solid cores. Uh, while well, the outer core of the Earth is molten through radioactivity, but Jupiter and the outer planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all gaseous planets. So uh, if you, Jupiter, some people say, was much larger than this, it would be another uh, sun. And uh, you'll find here that uh, uh, these are the options that people are considering for space travel. Uh, uh, just uh, moving from uh, the Earth to the Moon, we have used liquid hydrogen, LH2, and liquid oxygen uh, as the fuel uh, to reach uh, the Moon. However, uh, if you want to uh, reach the asteroid belts and Mars, uh, we uh, need to think maybe as uh, 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 using hydrogen uh, as a chemical rocket and combine it with oxygen. Again, L, uh, liquid oxygen and liquid uh, hydrogen. Uh, beyond this, uh, to Jupiter and the other uh, planets, uh, uh, probes are being sent there through using gravitation in general. Uh, this is the comparison of the size of the a chemical rocket uh, compared to the nuclear rocket for a Mars mission. Uh, the chemical rocket uh, would be 285 feet in height. Uh, the nuclear rocket would be also very large in size. However, uh, the weight of it is uh, 9 million pounds in Earth orbit. Uh, whereas uh, if you divide that by a factor of 10, uh, then this would be the size of a nuclear rocket. And they did mention uh, the higher specific impulse uh, for a shorter, uh, this, uh, uh, for a faster acceleration and a shorter mission time. Uh, now the interest of course is on Mars, but we have to think about Mars uh, uh, Mars being very, very different from the Earth. As I suggested, Mars is smaller in diameter than the Earth. Uh, the distance from the sun is obviously larger. However, the temperature on Mars is very, very, very uh, low. So at night, it basically any material there freezes. So we need energy stored from solar collector in the morning, or alternatively, we will need just nuclear reactors to produce power for us uh, or wind power. Uh, uh, Mars is uh, notorious for its very high wind speed almost continuously. Uh, what's different on Mars is that its uh, atmosphere is primarily 96% carbon dioxide, whereas the atmosphere on Earth is 78% nitrogen. We are breathing primarily nitrogen here, and then 21% only is uh, oxygen. So uh, that is not simple. In fact, the latest probe on Mars has tried to uh, produce uh, oxygen from uh, chemicals that uh, uh, are uh, maybe on, uh, well, hopefully it is um, chemicals from Mars itself. Uh, what's important there is that uh, the gravity on Earth, uh, because the Earth has its atmosphere uh, still protected, uh, it's a 100 pounds uh, in weight, uh, the force of gravity. Uh, on Mars, it's very, very low gravity, 30 pounds on Mars. So in that case, Mars doesn't have enough gravity. And because it doesn't have enough atmosphere, uh, there is no protection on the surface of Mars from solar radiation. So the early uh, uh, astronauts that would live on, the, uh, on Mars cannot live on the surface. Uh, yet you see depictions uh, by different uh, groups showing large cylinders on the surface of Mars where those astronauts would live. Uh, those astronauts don't, don't have protection against space radiation. Uh, they'll have basically to build their bases either underground or on the sides of cliffs uh, uh, in general. 
And of course, the uh, difference is that here, the Earth, we have 7 billion people on Mars. It's still zero up to our best knowledge. Uh, there are as con uh, conceptualizations of uh, uh, missions to Mars. So I think it may become reality in our lifetime. It would be a wonderful thing uh, to happen. There are challenges, though, for the trip to Mars. And in that case, uh, if you need power, uh, well, you can depend on wind energy. Uh, if you want, uh, the early probes depended on solar energy, uh, but the solar collectors of photovoltaics uh, uh, simply get covered with uh, dust and uh, they do not operate, uh, uh, they lose their uh, operability. Uh, some probes, interestingly enough, were covered with dust. They lost their operation and then came a storm and wiped up the dust of the surface of the photocells and they became operational uh, again. Uh, one uh, suggestion, as I suggested, for a, a, nu a nuclear engine is one that would uh, use a fission core, uh, and uh, in the fission core, you heat up hydrogen and exhaust it in a nozzle. Uh, there was, uh, though, that Orion uh, uh, project that they experimented with, and uh, for anybody uh, designing a system of that kind, I'll give you the basic relations here. I give you uh, some conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, a type of a derivation of uh, the Orion concept or the uh, external pulse protection. You would have that uh, shock absorber plate. You throw little nuclear devices away from the, uh, the space uh, ship, you explode them, uh, you generate a shock wave. The shock wave uh, is absorbed by the shock absorber at the bottom of the rocket and conservation of momentum would propel the rocket uh, out uh, to uh, to uh, up and uh, So the design of that shock plate is a very, a very important undertaking uh, to absorb the shock from uh, a small uh, nuclear explosion, in fact. And some people even try to design such a, uh, a uh, shock absorber plate. One of them is shown here uh, at San Diego. They run some experiments uh, uh, at uh, General Atomics in San Diego. So that uh, could be a, a situation for uh, a very simple design. You would assemble it obviously in space. And uh, so that, this is shows some experiments here where they are trying to check the idea of the uh, impulse from uh, an external explosion that would propel a rocket. Uh, but uh, done on Earth here, you could see that they have a chemical charge. They explode it here. This is the shock absorber plate under a, uh, a model of the spacecraft. And you could see here, they explode the chemical rocket. And this is what's called the Orion type of a project. And indeed, uh, the shock wave gets the rocket to uh, rise. And you do it in a pulse manner. So you, you throw away a small uh, a nuclear device, explode it, oops, you get uh, a propulsion uh, uh, in the front. I show you here the fraction of the solid angle intercepted by the pusher plates, which becomes a very important aspect of it. Because if you have an explosion here, it will distribute the energy over the whole uh, four pi r squared. Uh, and uh, it's only a part of it that will hitch, hit that pusher plate. So redesigning the device itself, a nuclear device, in such a way that it has a directed form of energy uh, would help. Uh, because the specific impulse definitely in that case will depend on uh, the cosine of the solid angle uh, over which uh, the shock wave is reaching the pusher plate, as they call it. So in that case, you use what's called the directed energy type of a device. And uh, this is uh, a device uh, under uh, where you have a fission uh, explosion, uh, whatever, plutonium or uranium-235, and uh, you create uh, radiation inside the casing here, and then you get a propellant on the top, just maybe some plastic or paraffin wax. The heat from the explosion will evaporize that propellant, and uh, as it is vaporized, it has a better solid angle, so the energy is not wasted over the four pi r squared uh, uh, surface, but uh, uh, it is uh, just, uh, uh, directed towards a, a, a prop they call it a propellant. That propellant now expands and hits uh, the pusher plate. Uh, some materials have been suggested uh, as tungsten, uh, uh, 
the the uh, tungsten was suggested as the uh, material in the pusher plate and the channel filler uh, that uh, directs the energy uh, to the propellant. This would be the channel here would be beryllium uh, oxide and the radiation case itself that would direct the energy in this direction would be uranium. This is as much as uh, has been shown in the open literature about this uh, idea in general. So in essence, uh, the Orion concept, uh, this is from the General Atomic Company at San Diego, California. Uh, you would uh, create a, uh, <clears throat> you create basically a plasma uh, of an expanding cloud uh, uh, of the propellant and you try to shape it in such a way uh, that it takes the shape of a, uh, in the solid angle to hit the solid plate and not expand uh, in the whole uh, uh, four pi r squared solid angle uh, in general. Uh, this has to do with uh, uh, some peculiar aspect of a plasma that is expanding in space. And some of you in aerospace may do some research about it uh, to simulate the process. But in essence, uh, in space, because of the conservation uh, of momentum aspects of the, uh, of the whole idea, uh, if you start with a, uh, a, a puck, like a cylinder that is uh, 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 basically uh, uh, from uh, a pancake type of a plasma, when it expands in space, meaning that there is no pressure around it, it turns itself into a cylinder. So that is what you would like to do. You want your pancake to expand into a cylinder and hit uh, the, uh, the uh, pusher plate of the Orion uh, type of a spaceship. The interesting thing is that the opposite also would occur. If you start with a plasma, in the shape of a cylinder. As it expands, it turns back into a pancake. And uh, some people thought also about a variable density pusher plate. And uh, there are practical considerations that this spaceship would have to be assembled in space. You cannot send it from uh, Earth. Uh, at that point uh, in time, uh, the thinking that is going on uh, is to use a chemical rocket for a trip to Mars. I think it is not uh, really, uh, practical <laughs> that it would take uh, uh, years to reach uh, Mars. Uh, however, just uh, to show the comparison with the Saturn V rocket that uh, was used in the Apollo missions to the moon, uh, basically uh, SpaceX uh, uh, with Mr. Elon Musk is thinking about a Mars vehicle, which would be uh, even larger than the Saturn V uh, rocket. And uh, so that is uh, uh, a, a diagram for um, uh, SpaceX uh, that would use uh, tanks. Uh, they're thinking about a chemical rocket uh, where they would use uh, 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 densified methane uh, gas and uh, use oxygen as a propellant. So they'll have two tanks. It's a chemical rocket. Remember, it is a chemical rocket. So they would have uh, the densified uh, methane uh, with the oxygen propellant. They combine them together in many, many different nozzles here at the bottom to provide the thrust for the rocket. So that is uh, the current way of thinking. I think uh, it is not the right way. It is not going to work really. Uh, uh, a better way using nuclear propellants is, uh, should be uh, foreseen. Nevertheless, the, uh, uh, the active uh, uh, transport vehicle itself would be about 50 meters in uh, length. Uh, and uh, uh, the basically, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the weight could be about 300 tons and imagine that you have to launch that into uh, space. It uses lots of energy. One way of doing it better is to uh, place it on a plane like a large uh, cargo plane and then launch it uh, high up in the atmosphere so you may not need as much fuel as launching the whole rocket from uh, Earth. So. Uh, but the main thing, main idea there is again the idea of uh, Elon Musk of uh, saving on the cost of such a project by using reusable uh, boosters. So the boosters would be uh, reusable and, uh, uh, and they succeeded in launching rockets and then landing them back uh, again. So that would be uh, the type of engine that uh, they would use for maybe a chemical trip, a chemical fuel trip to Mars, at the bottom you would have so many of those engines, uh, 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 the, the 
it's called the Raptor engines cluster. And uh, basically you'll have an outer ring that has 21 rockets and the inner ring has 14 rocket. And then in the center, you have seven rockets. So just add those up. That's uh, 11, 12, uh, uh, 32, 42 uh, of those uh, engines uh, uh, to be able to launch uh, the rocket. And uh, they think again about a reusable vehicle that they'll send to Mars. Uh, they'll separate the living modules. They land it there. And I think the way it is looking here, uh, because there is no uh, uh, consideration about uh, the fuel to retrieve uh, that ship is basically a one-way trip to Mars. So you, uh, some people have volunteered for that trip uh, to Mars. They'll go to Mars and just stay there until they die, uh, or uh, other uh, pioneers will join them. Uh, there is no provision for building a base that protects them against space radiation, against storms on Mars. The wind speed there is about 100 miles per hour. Uh, this is thinking that needs to be modified by providing protection for these uh, early uh, pioneer astronauts from uh, the solar wind from space radiation, as I suggested, the atmosphere of Mars is very, very thin, so they don't have protection against space radiation. They have to uh, build uh, enclosures out of the regolith, which is the dust uh, on the surface uh, of Mars. Uh, this uh, shows us here the time uh, that is considered uh, for uh, a trip uh, to Mars. And uh, you could see here that uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, different payload will give you different uh, times, and uh, it's not clear to me, but it's a uh, hundred. Uh, the trip time days is 115 uh, days, so that's the average uh, uh, trip time, depending on different uh, distances between the Earth and Mars. A nuclear rocket would uh, reduce that to two, three weeks, so uh, because of the specific impulse. So it's very serious thinking has to be put into nuclear rocket. Uh, uh, a large project uh, has been thought about by uh, the British Interplanetary Society, and they designate it as a Daedalus uh, project. Uh, now, this is not just a trip to Mars. Uh, uh, in 1973 and 1978, they thought about a trip to Alpha Centauri, one of the nearest stars uh, to the Earth. And in that case, uh, uh, the ship called the Daedalus would have very large tanks in, containing uh, uh, probably hydrogen. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the ship name is, the project was named Daedalus, but the ship itself was named Icarus. Uh, that's a British interplanetary uh, society type of a project. And uh, uh, we know now uh, from this uh, Hubble Space Photogra uh, uh, Telescope there are hundreds, hundreds of planets that uh, have been discovered around uh, solar systems, and maybe one of them would uh, allow for life like what we have on Earth. Uh, so they planned a trip to uh, basically Alpha Centauri, uh, uh, and uh, it would be a star system, uh, and uh, it is a small star 4.2 light years away. So if the spaceship moves at the space of light, it will take it 4.2 years. Obviously, we cannot move at the space of light because if you move at the space of light, you are now in the form of a photon of energy. You are not a, a matter anymore. So uh, uh, we cannot ignore our uh, way of trying to uh, travel to other uh, parts of the solar uh, system. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, this is a dream of humanity. It may happen uh, in your lifetime or uh, maybe uh, in the lifetime of your <laughs> children or grandchildren, but it will remain uh, as a, uh, uh, a, a, a dream for humanity uh, in general. Uh, new developments in uh, propulsion uh, for space application is use plasma propulsion. Uh, and uh, photonic and laser propulsion. So in laser propulsion, you direct the laser towards the surface that absorbs it and an exchange in momentum would propel the spacecraft uh, to its direction. So you could see here, they create a large, large sail and uh, the sail now would be irradiated by lasers from the Earth to direct it towards 
historicists. Some uh, designs even consider, say, that the solar wind itself or solar radiation would be absorbed by the sail and uh, uh, that would uh, direct it towards Mars. These are all very interesting conceptual design. Some people even consider the use of antimatter uh, for such system. And a very, very, very far-fetched idea is to use uh, uh, basically a warping uh, uh, of the space-time uh, continuum. So say if you warp the space-time continuum in the front of a spaceship, that's called the Albutier, uh, Albutier uh, uh, propellant, uh, propulsion. And if you alter the space-time uh, 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 system behind the spacecraft, then uh, the spacecraft will start moving from the area of the uh, 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 enlarged or high uh, space-time continuum to the area of flow. And that would be a propellant system, very, of course, science fiction <laughs> based, uh, Albuquerque uh, space-time continuum. And people have uh, really talked about it in different conferences and science fiction like uh, is definitely uh, very ripe with ideas along this line and uh, uh, science fiction can become a uh, reality. Uh, this is reality, as I said, in the making of a project in uh, Russia. And uh, they are really building here a device that uh, <coughs> they, they call the nuclear space tug. And uh, uh, basically they have trusses for mounting cooling systems and uh, have radiator panels for cooling and uh, in that case, that uses electric propulsion or ion thruster uh, propulsion. So space uh, uh, is some kind of a topic that uh, uh, is, uh, 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 is the next kind of a step for humanity in general. Uh, Robert Frost, the poet wrote, uh, someday the world will end in fire, others say in ions. <clears throat> the unique event of life on earth will not last eternally. Uh, biological life on Earth depends on the sun, which will not last forever. So the solar constant is gradually increasing. With the sun becoming brighter and hotter and larger, at some point, the sun is going to engulf the Earth and the inner planet. So before that happens, humanity may have found other homes uh, at other uh, solar systems and uh, life would be spread in the rest of the universe. I'll conclude here that chapter by uh, reading the last paragraph, humans are bound to biologically engineer new forms of life adapted to the vacuum of space or on the surface of frozen moons like uh, Ganymede or Europa. Uh, such mobile life will free itself from the planet's gravitational traps, inhibiting its free movement. Uh, a, a Freeman Dyson, a Princeton cosmologist, suggests that perhaps our destiny is to be the midwives to help the living universe to be born. Once life escapes from this little planet, the Earth, there'll be no stopping it. So that's uh, uh, some interesting uh, uh, material for uh, thinking about. Uh, I'll go to the chat room. If you have questions, uh, I'll answer some questions. Uh, if not, uh, we continue learning about nuclear space applications. I made the point in that chapter that for uh, any kind of uh, space travel, uh, that is serious, really not uh, uh, fictitious or science fiction only, uh, nuclear energy is going to be uh, uh, adopted by humanity uh, to reach uh, not just other planet in our solar system, but even beyond our solar system. If any questions are there, I'll answer them. Otherwise, we won't waste our time and we keep uh, covering another chapter. No questions, so I'll uh, want to waste our time. Uh, we go and cover another chapter uh, in the nuclear applications uh, in space. Uh, let us uh, look at space radiation. It, that's a topic of interest to both the our electrical engineers, uh, which uh, have the task of sending uh, satellites into space and uh, shielding them against space radiation and the future astronauts that have to survive in a very, very uh, radiation intensive environment. So if you send astronauts in space, you have to protect them against radiation in general, not only the astronauts, but the equipment itself. So you have to, the terminology here is hardening uh, the uh, equipment uh, in general. 
uh, it is important to study the effects of uh, uh, space radiation in space missions uh, from the perspective of its effect on living organisms, such as the astronauts uh, that would be in orbiting space station or in bases on the moon or on Mars. Uh, the moon has absolutely no protection against space radiation. Uh, particularly the solar wind. Uh, you have to consider what materials you use in the space environment, not just uh, to protect people, but also to protect your instruments. Uh, you have to shield the materials and the electronics and the life support systems. And it's inevitable when astronauts uh, are uh, being launched to the space station that they should go through a very, very harsh radiation environment that is a Van Allen belt around the Earth's crust. So if you send people into space, you have to protect them against the effects of space radiation. Uh, this is the latest uh, mission uh, that landed on the moon. Remember, very few people know that there were six landings on the moon. Uh, that was the Apollo 17 mission on the moon on December 19, 1972. That was about uh, 39 or 40 years uh, ago. Uh, the possible uh, uh, of course, uh, other, other goal for space exploration is Mars. And uh, Mars be is uh, becoming some kind of uh, the emphasis, even though some people suggest that we should build a base on the moon before uh, we think about going to Mars. Now let's talk ra space radiation. Uh, on space missions, the, uh, the, we encounter two forms of radiation. Uh, one of them is the galactic cosmic rays, abbreviated as GCRs. These are particles that uh, uh, permeate all of space, and they were caused uh, by uh, supernovae or explosions, like stars that used up their nuclear fuel, and uh, simply the gravitational force uh, started predominating, and they exploded. As they exploded, they generated those cosmic rays that come to us and come to Earth, in fact, uh, almost isotropically from all different directions from other parts of the universe. If we are within the solar system, uh, other than the cosmic uh, 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 galactic cosmic rays, we also have uh, solar energetic particles that are designated as SEPs. Uh, they are not associated with solar flares and uh, coronal mass ejections, uh, uh, which are in fact associated with the solar flares and the coronal mass ejection that happened when the sun is active. Uh, the last uh, two or three years, we were in a period of the solar cycle, 11 to 22 years, where the uh, sun was not active, but it is coming back uh, into an active position and the magnetic fields basically can eject radiation from uh, the sun. Uh, current spacecraft shield more effectively against the SEPs, uh, solar kind of particles than the galactic cosmic rays. The galactic cosmic rays really have extremely high energies and uh, they're designated as HZE particles. Uh, HZE particles stand for high Z and high energy uh, particles. For example, uh, 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 an ion of iron. An ion of iron would carry not uh, just a million electron volt energy like uh, uh, in radiation on Earth, it carries energy in the giga electron volt, giga electron volts of energy. And uh, something that is not very well known is uh, really what is the effect of space radiation, how much of that uh, galactic space radiation reaches us on Earth. And uh, a gentleman, Mr. Charles Wilson, invented a device, uh, experimental device called the cloud chamber in 1896 that helps us uh, see uh, radiation from uh, cosmic radiation. So that's a cloud chamber, and it shows a nuclear disintegration resulting from a cosmic ray particle. You could see the cosmic ray particle here coming in here. Then you have the cloud chamber that contains a, a, a vapor of a saturated liquid, maybe al just alcohol. Uh, then you have plates that have different potentials. So you could see that uh, the cosmic ray particle came in here and generated what is called the cosmic ray shower. So what is a cosmic ray shower? Remember that particle comes in uh, with a uh, uh, with an energy in the giga uh, electron uh, volt and uh, we it, it may be originating the black hole that is thought to be at the center of the uh, Milky Way uh, galaxy. 
So as I suggested, uh, when uh, that cosmic ray interacts with the top of the atmosphere, and it has such a high energy, giga electron volt, or uh, uh, when you say mega, that's a million electron volt. When you say uh, uh, giga electron volt, that's a million, uh, it's a uh, uh, thousand million uh, electron volt. Uh, the cosmic particle would be like, say, iron uh, would interact with an atmospheric nucleus. It could be remember uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere or with oxygen, any atmospheric particle. And uh, it generates what's called the cosmic ray shower. And the cosmic ray shower produces many uh, other particles. It can produce neutrons, it can produce protons, and these get absorbed very quickly. But there are also other particles that are generated that are maybe 200 to 300 times the mass of the electron. And uh, this could be uh, basically what's, that's what we call a charge uh, ray particles. It could also generate gamma rays, as you could see here, but uh, the muons and the pions, uh, mu here represents the muons, that is particles that have about 200, uh, 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 200 electron masses in general. And you could be sitting right now uh, on your desk and watching your computer screen and being irradiated by cosmic ray shower and you would not sense it. So it's part of the ubiquity of radiation uh, in, uh, in the atmosphere or in the Earth's environment uh, in general. So cosmic ray showers uh, can occur not just for astronauts in space, but for instrumentation in space, uh, uh, electrical instrumentation, as well uh, as the uh, uh, as uh, humans or spacecraft in spacecraft, but also while students are watching a lecture like we are doing uh, right now. Some uh, large uh, cosmic ray showers can have an intensity of a million particles with an energy, say, on average of the smeons and pions of 10 million electron volts. And uh, basically, that can be attenuated by a factor of 100. And uh, so we can calculate from this the initial energy in the particles initiating the shower. And the initial energy would be I, the 1 million particles uh, uh, in a shower, that's 1 million particles, each one of them carrying 10 million electron volt of energy per particle, uh, multiplied by the, uh, uh, the attenuation by a factor of 100 in the atmosphere of 100 electron volt per million electron volt. So one of those uh, cosmic ray particles can be estimated to have uh, 10 to the 15 electron volts. And as I said, uh, that would be 1 million giga electron volts. Wow. And uh, you find that uh, those subatomic particles is a zoo uh, that some people put into a table, very much like the uh, periodic table of the elements. And uh, they have... Uh, subdivisions, uh, as you know, the subatomic particles, the hadrons, these are the baryons, strongly interacting fermions, uh, and the fermions is particles like the electrons in that case, these are, can be protons, <clears throat> and uh, the antiparticle of it is the antiproton, and the mass of the proton is uh, uh, in energy units, 938 million electron volts, so it's at about one atomic mass unit. It could be a neutron, but look at the particles that these uh, baryons could uh, exist uh, in. The lambda hyperon, the sigma plus hyperon, the sigma zero hyperon, the sigma minus hyperon, the xi minus cascade hyperon. And not as a word cascade here because it happens in cascade showers. Uh, the common decay product could be uh, uh, the pions here and or a proton. So pion and proton. And uh, you can get also radiation in general. Uh, the cosmic ray particles uh, can also be in the form of masons. Uh, the masons, uh, these are strongly interactive particles. Uh, you can have the pions, the pi minus, the pi zero, the kaons, uh, k minus, and uh, their masses, as you, as I suggested, uh, is not one proton mass, 931.55 million electron volts. This is 139, so that is almost the mass. Uh, <coughs> uh, if uh, you take 0.51 as the mass of the electron, so this is 200 electron or 260 electron masses. And uh, then you have other elementary particles that we know of in space radiation. Obviously, we know the photons, <coughs> uh, 
uh, gamma rays and X-rays, but they speak also about the graviton. Uh, it is not a very well-known particle, but uh, we have the leptons. This would be the muons, and it shows they are described with the minus muon or the tau particles, the tau neutrino. And uh, again, it's 105 uh, 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 million electron volt of energy, which about is 200 uh, multiplied by 0.51, the energy equivalent of the electron. So it's uh, 200, uh, almost 200 electron masses in muons in that case. We have the different neutrinos associated with them. Uh, the leptons are also include the electrons, which we know is 0.51 million electron volt. It's a stable particle, but you can have the neutrino electron, the neutrino muon, the neutrino tau particle. It's a whole zoo of particles, very short-lived though, uh, that we know of. We also have the quarks, if you have heard about them. Uh, we have the up quark, the down quark, the charm, the strange, the top, the bottom, and we have uh, uh, what I would consider uh, still like uh, uh, theoretical particles that happen in high energy physics application, the W particle and the Z particle. And uh, the weakly interacting massive particles that are designated as the WIMPs, and uh, they're talking about the neutralino, not the neutrino, but neutralino, uh, and as a basis of dark matter uh, uh, in the universe itself. So we are really uh, uh, in a sea of uh, radiation, uh, not just in outer space, but even here uh, on Earth. Uh, we know of that uh, cosmic rays uh, 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 generate uh, radioactive species that uh, uh, basically affect us as on, uh, uh, in life on Earth. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, 73% of the atmosphere is really nitrogen. Uh, the neutrons from the cosmic radiation interact with the nitrogen-14 uh, isotope and produces a proton and uh, carbon-14. And carbon-14 is a radioactive particle. Uh, some of uh, uh, the deutrons uh, in, uh, in the water in the, our ocean can absorb a neutron. And that creates a very, very small trace amount of tritium uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, other isotopes can be produced by cosmic ray particles. We know the unit of activity, so uh, we are going to bypass it. Uh, but uh, the creation of the carbon-14 uh, is a very important process in terms of archaeology. As we suggested, basically, uh, the production of carbon-14 uh, uh, that has a half-life of 5,730 years is an ongoing process in the Earth's crust. So as long as a living creature is living, uh, say a tree uh, or a human or a plant, uh, the carbon-14 is being absorbed in the human body. When the creature dies, uh, that carbon-14 is not absorbed anymore. So if you consider the equilibrium activity of carbon-14 and uh, <clears throat> you uh, calculate how much it has decayed, you can calculate the age of the, uh, uh, the archaeological uh, uh, item. For instance, uh, the charcoal uh, from some uh, early man uh, fires. Uh, so if you consider the radioactive decay law, if you take the natural logarithm of the activity uh, as a function of time, uh, and if you solve for the time, you get the time for an archaeological sample that contains carbon-14 as being equal to the activity uh, of the sample uh, multiplied by, say, the half-life divided into the natural logarithm of two. And then you have the natural logarithm of the equilibrium uh, activity of the sample uh, uh, that is produced from cosmic radiation. And when you measure the sample activity in the laboratory, you can get the time or the age at, at which the sample stopped absorbing uh, the uh, radioactive isotope. So in that case, it becomes the activity divided uh, per uh, unit mass uh, in general. So if you measure the activity of the archaeological sample, uh, you can determine its weight by dividing the, uh, the specific activity by uh, the mass of the sample uh, itself. So in that case, you can, uh, by substituting in uh, the equation that we derived for T here, uh, you can determine the age of the sample uh, 
uh, that you get say from a, uh, a tomb maybe from the time of uh, uh, the old dynasties in India, China, Egypt, uh, the Middle East or whatever. Uh, this is the, some of the radioactive isotopes that uh, cosmic radiation creates in the atmosphere. Tritium, 12.3 uh, years uh, half-life, it turned into helium-3. Beryllium-7, beryllium-10, this is a very long-lived isotope, so once created, it stays there. Carbon-14 is the one used for carbon dating, as I call it. Uh, Sodium-22, silicon-32, phosphorus-32, phosphorus-33, sulfur-35, and chlorine-36. Uh, definitely, we also dealt uh, in the, the chapter on uh, radiation units with the absorbed dose. And uh, the unit in that case is red, radiation absorbed dose, which is 100 Earths per gram. And the SI system of units is one gray. And we know that one red is one hundredth of a gray, one centigrade. So in that case, uh, this is uh, radiation. And this is uh, a picture, a photograph of Mr. Louis Gray. He was a radiation pioneer uh, who lived uh, over the period 1905 to 1965. And the name Gray uh, is used as the unit uh, to honor him in the SI system of unit. All right, so now that we have uh, those rates, uh, uh, we have looked at this uh, before. Uh, we are going to use uh, not the unit of the REM or the sievert, we're going to use the uh, gray just so that it applies to solid materials. Uh, uh, when you have living materials, especially humans, we use the, uh, uh, those equivalent uh, uh, component. Uh, for our external sources, uh, we can suggest that uh, uh, basically uh, the source, uh, uh, we can get a yearly dose uh, uh, of 0.28 milligray per year. Uh, but uh, internal to the, so that is primarily caused in, in more detail than uh, when I covered earlier uh, from Neutrons, terrestrial radiation, uh, cosmic rays at 20,000 feet if you fly in an airplane. Not as, it, uh, as it, an airline pilot, you receive a much larger uh, dose uh, per year per uh, individual. Uh, at the top of the atmosphere, uh, the cosmic radiation uh, contributes uh, 30 millirad per year. Internal of the body, we have the potassium 40 uh, that is. Uh, <laughs> radioactive with a billion year half-life. So once you eat a banana and you get some potassium-14 in your body, uh, well, it stays there forever. Uh, Carbon-14, uh, radium-226, radium-228, and some tritium. And the average total dose of the body is 100 uh, uh, millirad per year per person or per capita. Uh, the radiation can cause uh, damage to living organisms in that uh, it can uh, especially the uh, uh, damage can ca uh, caused by high Z particles, as I suggested, iron, for instance, uh, nuclei or silicon uh, nuclei. Uh, the ability uh, and they basically can break uh, the strands of the, in the chromosomes affect uh, knock out because they are ionizing radiation in that case, knock out some of the uh, uh, genes along the strands of the chromosomes. So, and uh, remember that uh, if you have an X-ray track, uh, the X-ray is electromagnetic radiation. It can go through uh, the strand of DNA <coughs> or the chromosome and maybe knock out one little gene off uh, and cause some damage. But the damage is not as uh, powerful or as uh, 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 significant as if you get a heavy ion track. And those heavy ions would be those iron ions that we said are HZE elements. So in that case, you find that the heavy track iron uh, affects the chromosomes in a much, much more uh, significant way. It can break the strands of the chromosome and, uh, uh, and uh, either cause the death of the cell uh, because those chromosomes uh, uh, carry on the body functions inside the nucleus of each cell. And, uh, but you could see the relative damage from a heavy ion track uh, damaging a single chromosome compared to an X-ray track. And uh, in fact, the astronauts uh, being up on the spaceships have been uh, affected by that uh, uh, space radiation. So it's very crucial to uh, 
shield our spaceships, especially that those astronauts once sent to the space station will have to go through the radiation belts of the Earth when they are launched out and when they are brought back in. And I watched a video by an astronaut. Uh, he was questioned about radiation and he didn't know that he was subjected to space radiation going as being uh, launched uh, through the uh, uh, Van Allen space uh, belt. And uh, these are some uh, 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 chromosomes in the cell of one astronaut. And you could see here uh, that there uh, was a fragmented chromosome totally destroyed. You could see here, uh, this is a picture actually of actual chromosomes uh, in the cells of an astronaut uh, subject to space radiation that has been fragmented. Uh, fragmentation comes in from those heavy ions on a much, much larger scale than if you get from an X-ray or a gamma uh, ray. And uh, in other cases, uh, you find that uh, those br broken parts of that chromosome can insert themselves into other chromosomes. You could see that that's called an insertion. And uh, that insertion in that case uh, uh, causes <laughs> a mutation. So now that cell uh, can either die uh, uh, cannot, if it cannot survive or continue dividing and you end up over a long period of time getting not just mutations, but you get a cancer in that case. So it's very important uh, for our space program once we start going to the moon and Mars and send space uh, ships out in space and uh, for Mr. Bezos and uh, 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 other uh, people to find themselves on trips into space uh, to shield them against space radiation and to stay away from the Van Allen belts as much as uh, possible. Okay, now we turn now to our uh, unit that we uh, wrote earlier uh, for biological matter because we want to protect people against radiation. We cannot just deal with the red or the energy absorbed by the material. We want to consider the different forms of radiation effect on uh, basically living matter, particularly humans. So we talk about the REM, uh, radiation uh, equivalent man, and uh, its unit in the SI system, as a reminder, the sievert, and one hundredth of a sievert or one centisievert is equal to one rem. This is an estimate here of uh, uh, what uh, we can expect in terms of radiation uh, in, uh, uh, that humans would be subjected to in space. And that, that will make even the point uh, more important that we mentioned uh, earlier uh, that uh, uh, we need to use uh, high impulse type of rockets for a trip to Mars. Uh, ISS here stands for the International Space Station. And this is a dose equivalent in hundreds of uh, millions of, uh, uh, one thousand of a sievert, one millisievert that they receive per day, per day. So if I uh, send an astronaut and he remains on the space station for a year, we can say that he receives 365 times uh, that particular dose. So in the International Space Station, uh, this uh, differs from one day to the other, as you could see here, because of course the radiation from the sun differs from one day to the other. And the six months average uh, for the International Space Station then is about point, uh, about point 0.5 uh, uh, millisievert per, uh, per day. So it differs from one day to the other. Now, let us think about a trip to Mars. And it's not just a trip living on the surface of Mars, which we said has no atmosphere. So people there, uh, the early uh, settlers would have uh, uh, to deal with space radiation without an atmosphere to protect them like the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so if you stay just in Mars orbit, uh, that 0.5 uh, dose equivalent millisievert per day now uh, becomes uh, about uh, 1.3 uh, millisievert per person per uh, day. And uh, the average over a six month stay uh, average at Mars uh, would be uh, at the range of 1.3 millisievert per person per day. Multiply that by uh, 365 and you get the dose that they received uh, uh, over uh, the period that they would stay on Mars. So shielding those uh, astronauts and protecting them is something that is very important. So 
uh, I'll give you a problem just to get an idea about how much it is uh, a simple calculation, simply multiplying numbers and dates. Uh, the overall uncertainty in the risk to humans due to ionizing radiation in space can be attributed to three broad categories. Uh, uncertainty in the characterization of the radiation itself. We don't know exactly what kind of radiation those astronauts or early settlers on the moon or Mars will have. Uh, uncertainty in the effect of shielding, uh, which can produce a great variety of secondary park. Remember the build up factors uh, when uh, gamma rays produce uh, pair, uh, uh, the process of pair production, they produce uh, uh, a, a positron and a, uh, an electron and the positron uh, combines with an electron to produce two gamma photons. The most significant uncertainty in estimating the risk lies in the response of cells and issues to the radiation environment that they encounter. So if we are gonna send humans into space, uh, it is our duty professionally and ethically to protect them against what they can encounter there. As I said, <laughs> there was a video of an astronaut who didn't even know that uh, they went through uh, the uh, uh, Van Allen belts and that are suggested to radiation as they were launched into the International Space Station and were, as they were being brought back. And that is uh, unprofessional for them, uh, for non, them not to be told about what they're being subjected to. So what are the space radiation sources? So if, uh, the main one, as we suggested, is the galactic cosmic rays, which can have very, very high uh, energy. And then we have the SPE, the solar particle events. These are the two sources that we have to shield uh, instrumentation in spaceships and uh, for astronauts uh, in general for trips to Mars, the moon, or uh, colonies built on Mars or on the moon. So you'll find that the flux or the particles per second per square centimeter uh, depends really uh, uh, on the type of radiation. So the solar wind protons have a very large flux, but uh, their particle energy is low. So they're in the range of 0.1 million electron volt. But if you go to galactic cosmase, you find that their flux uh, uh, is small. So the number crossing unit area per unit time is small, but look at that energy, uh, 10,000 million electron volt, 10 giga electron volts. Uh, other uh, sources of radiation are trapped electrons in the earth, in the, uh, uh, in the earth's uh, 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 radiation belts. Uh, uh, this is the outer zone of the uh, Van Allen belts, uh, they trap protons. Uh, remember the Earth's magnetic field uh, traps the solar wind and protects life on Earth and the, our oceans and our atmosphere from vaporizing into space. When we have solar storms, uh, you, you, you notice on the so surface of the sun, those black uh, really uh, solar uh, uh, flares uh, you'll find that uh, protons are primarily the source and they have basically energies in the range of 1 million electron volts. So the higher the energy, the lower the flux, luckily for us, so we can send our astronauts into the space sheet, uh, stage. Uh, the galactic uh, X-rays, uh, 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 the galactic uh, radiation, the uh, HZE as we call them, uh, you'll find that uh, they can be uh, high Z elements like iron or low Z elements like carbon, oxygen, magnesium, neon, and silicon. We can say these are intermediate sized uh, particles, but uh, uh, their abundance uh, basically uh, differs uh, uh, in space radiation. I mentioned iron as a typical uh, source uh, of uh, particles carrying the galactic cosmic radiation. Uh, this is the HZE particle, high Z uh, particles, iron, carbon, and helium. You'll find uh, they basically, this is their distribution. Uh, the higher the kinetic energy, the lower uh, the uh, intensity or the flux of those particles. But notice that they're primarily hydrogen or proton nuclei and helium nuclei. That would be uh, from the solar wind, but carbon and iron would be uh, galactic uh, cosmic rays that permeate uh, the, the universe. Uh, uh, some other important aspects that we worry about in terms of space radiation for our astronauts or for our early settlers, say on Mars or on the moon, is the solar particle events. The sun sometimes gets those 
sunspots, and the sunspots mean that uh, the sun is active, ejecting uh, parts of uh, the atmosphere, the plasma of the sun. And these are seen uh, when the sun is active. Right now, it is. Uh, it was for two or three years in a, uh, because it goes in a cycle, as we suggested, of 11 uh, multiplied by two, 22 years, 11 years cycle. Uh, you find that it was calm, but now it is uh, re-emerging again. And some people suggest that a re-emerging uh, uh, solar kind of uh, uh, constant, the sun becomes more active, uh, so it may affect the, the weather on Earth. So the uh, re uh, the, 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 the sun is uh, getting back uh, uh, into activity. So at some point you can see all the solar flares. Uh, an interesting observation is that they happen in twos. You find that when you have a solar flare, two here, two here. That's because the magnetic field lines go up above the, in the corona part of the sun, they go up as some kind of uh, a string uh, that is being, uh, pulled out and then they go out and then come back to the surface of the earth. So these are all uh, local magnetic field disruptions on the surface uh, uh, of uh, the sun. At some point, uh, those uh, disruptions eject parts of the sun itself as a plasma and uh, this becomes a solar flare in general. Something very serious happens every once in a while in the sun as coronal mass ejections. And coronal mass ejections now uh, uh, can be quite uh, huge. Uh, this is a, the SOHO satellite from NOAA. And uh, you find that uh, one of those mass ejections, the sun simply threw away part of its plasma up into space. And if it hits the Earth, well, the Earth's magnetic field protects us. But if it gets us a direct hit, it can uh, affect uh, communications and our uh, uh, power systems in a very, very deleterious way. And look how huge this is. This is uh, 28 uh, Earths uh, in thickness. Uh, the Earth is very tiny uh, uh, compared with the volume and the uh, size of the Earth. Uh, because the outer core of the Earth is uh, uh, liquid and the Earth is rotating, uh, there is a magnetic field that protects us from that solar wind and allowed Earth, basically life on Earth to evolve. Mars does not have uh, a similar type of a magnetic field to protect it. It has localized magnetic fields. Uh, so life on Mars uh, has not uh, basically, or has disappeared after maybe it have uh, been born. And that's what the existing probes on Mars are trying to uh, add, uh, in, uh, generate as information. Uh, you hear about all those, uh, 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 they, they have a name for it. They, they were called UFO, uh, UFOs, uh, and then they call them now UAPs, un, un, uh, uh, unmanned uh, 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 phenomena, and uh, that can be related somehow to anomalies in the uh, uh, interaction between the Earth's magnetic field and the solar wind itself. So you notice that uh, this is the axis of rotation of the Earth, but the uh, radiation belts have a different axis. So at some point, the radiation belt of the Earth are not very high in the atmosphere, and they can come in in different parts of the Earth and touch the ground. Oh, okay, now you'd expect in that to have many magnetic effects out of the, uh, basically, the radiation from space to uh, come close to the Earth. And the geometry here suggests that uh, in the area of uh, Brazil, maybe, or Argentina, uh, we get what's called the South uh, Atlantic anomaly, where the magnetic field of the Earth comes very close to the Earth's surface. And that's why they see probably all those events that they attribute to uh, extraterrestrial <laughs> intelligence. And uh, uh, look here, this is South America. If you look at the satellite picture here, and this is the area where basically the radiation dosage uh, in March, uh, what, uh, 1995. So this was a picture taken by the Mir 18 space station. That's the Russian space station of that South Atlantic anomaly. So there are parts of the earth, especially 
on the uh, eastern coast of uh, South America, but it will also show in Argentina and uh, Brazil and Argentina are notorious for reporting uh, unmanned uh, aerial phenomena uh, or unrecognized uh, 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 phenomena in general. So let us uh, uh, think more about, uh, uh, so somehow uh, the, the sun uh, radiation can affect us in interesting way. Uh, rem remember that particles uh, permeate all of space uh, in interstellar gas, uh, in matter dense, the, the main gas of grains is about 10 to minus 16 grams. So that's uh, the gases that uh, fill up the, uh, the whole uh, uh, space around us. We can be subject to electron bombardment, uh, to proton bombardment from the solar wind. Uh, there uh, even can get, we can get dust bombardment and the results can cause heating, permanent damage, or ionization to our equipment in space, like satellites and a GPS system, and so on. The radiation levels on Mars are very, very large because it doesn't have the protection of the atmosphere, as I said. So any base on Mars would have to get, provide protection to the astronauts against space radiation. And this is uh, just sobering uh, for those of you who uh, choose to uh, study uh, space. Uh, I, by all means, if you like the topic, try to, uh, and the challenge of it, uh, please to try to uh, interview with NASA. We had some students, as I suggested earlier, that uh, electrical engineers in particular, that uh, basically have, have been hired by learning that fascinating material. So today we cover the two chapters on nuclear and plasma space propulsion and about uh, cosmic and space radiation. I'll be in the chat room for any questions. 